the topic beauty and persuasion, I felt like was sort of a obvious, like, well, we all know what she's going to say about that. Um, uh, I'm, I, it feels like the obvious talk is to talk about how beauty is potent, it's powerful, it draws us, it's magnetic. That's the whole point of it. That's why you have to be aware of the adulterous woman. You know, like it's, it can lead you a bad direction, but it could also lead you a good direction. Um, beauty is there sort of by definition, it makes you want to take another bite listen to it again, you know, step closer to it, whatever, you know, whatever it is that, that you find beautiful or attractive, you, you're drawn towards it. And so, you know, how can we use our femininity and our gifts? And, you know, it just felt like a talk that would write itself. It also felt like a talk I've given before too many times. So I decided to take the more controversial route. <laughs> um, I do feel like that is a really important piece. Obviously, there's much that can be said. Um, on the topic of beauty, but it does feel like part one, sort of. And I do feel like I'm probably speaking to a room full of women who have, like, we've, we've thought about that, right? Like, if you don't feel like you have, like, if it's sort of like, wait, what, part one, what are you talking about? Honestly, I would refer you to Even Exile, which will probably be on the canon table because I did spend a lot of time, you know, like, trying to flesh that out a little bit and talk about... Um, why I think women are called towards that, but it's no good to sort of get everybody on board with, yes, you should pursue beauty in a God-honoring way, and if we do, that will be very persuasive to the world around us. If people have no idea what beauty actually is, you know, it's like I could get everybody convinced that we all need to get on a train to New York, you know, like all of us Christian women, and if we did, it would be amazing and that would be great unless nobody knows which one the train to New York is and everybody goes and hops on a bunch of other trains, you know, with different destinations. It feels like that question, the sort of more pertinent one, I suspect, in this room, would be like, okay, but what does that look like, though? You know, like, okay, fine, you've, you've convinced me of that, but, but where do we go from here? What is it supposed to actually look like? And I do feel like that's something that I heard in terms of like feedback from people who read Even Excel, it's like, I like it, this is great, except I don't know where to go. Like, I don't know what to do about it. And I do think that um, when you talk about what beauty is, that turns out to be a very controversial subject and controversial among conservative Christians where they, they will say sort of instinctively, you can't know what beauty is. Every, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Everybody has their own, you know, interpretation of what beauty is. And so how can you say that something is or is not beautiful? And it's funny because we live in this moment where they're trying to tell us with a straight face that you can't know what a woman is, right? Can't possibly be sure what a woman is or what a man is. It's a very difficult question. And, you know, it's all very up to our own private interpretations, right? And we're still fresh enough in that moment, that I think most conservative Christians are like, can you even believe how silly this is? You know, of course you can know what a woman is. It's very obvious. Um, but I don't think we noticed that they did this to the concept of beauty and they did it a long time ago. And Christians lost that battle so thoroughly that we don't even realize it's a question, right? It's like we lost it so badly and so long ago that I think probably 12 out of 10 conservative Christians would get this question wrong on a test. Um, you know, like you start to make some aesthetic judgment and, and conservative Christians will say, how can you say that? You don't know that. You don't know their heart. You couldn't possibly, you know, and get very defensive about the subject um, because we have been trained to think that beauty is in the eye of the beholder and beauty is this, this topic that is completely devoid of moral value, right? So it's like um, you could ask the question, is the outfit modest? And if you're a conservative Christian, you feel like that's a question that can be answered. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> that's a whole other ball of wax. But if you're a conservative, you would think like, okay, you know, the Bible says to be modest. So after the appropriate amount of flesh is covered, there is no more moral question that can be asked about that. There's no such thing as a God-hating style 
as long as it's modest, right? That's the only part of it that could have moral import. Or a song could have filthy lyrics, yes. But if it doesn't have filthy lyrics, then there's nothing at all that we could say about the music itself, whether or not the music is good or bad, or whether it's better or worse or whatever. Like, we're trained to think that aesthetics has no moral import whatsoever. And we've been trained by the very same people who are now saying also there's no such thing as a woman. So there's no such thing as beauty, objectively speaking, has been a very, very old lie. And I mean, this goes back to, you know, the aesthetic movement with Oscar Wilde. In the 19th century, he was saying this art has no moral component. Like it has no moral component whatsoever and only Philistines would think that it does. Art for art's sake, right? You're not teaching anything. You're not referencing anything. It just exists sort of in a bubble. And there was a reason that he was arguing for this. It was all part of this um, very destructive and God-hating <laughs> long march through time that we have been on. And they started with the difficult questions because it actually is a difficult one, right? I mean, it's true that um, man and woman is a little bit more self-evident than the notion of beauty because that is a very big topic. It's much more abstract. So they started with the trickier ones, right? They got us all convinced that, well, you know, in the eye of the beholder and all that, and it is true that everyone has different tastes. And if everyone has different tastes, then how could you possibly say that some is better than others, right? So they started on the difficult questions, and then, uh, lo and behold, now the barbarians are at the walls, <laughs> right? It's like, now we're sitting here thinking, how can they say that they don't know what a man or a woman is? And it's like, well, 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, we bought this, right? That there's no such thing as objectivity when it comes to stuff like this. So I do feel like conservative Christians are, are fighting in the last ditch a little bit. And you like to hope that we will hold, right? You hope that in another 50 years, we're not going to have all the conservative Christians saying, well, it's a very difficult question what a woman is. Um, you know, one hopes that we'll make a bit of a comeback. But it is true that we don't know what we're talking about when it comes to the question of beauty. And it's also true that our culture has gotten uglier and uglier and uglier as we have abandoned this notion that there is such a thing as standards in beauty. And if you were to just look at the average, I mean, I don't know, look at just candid street photography from like maybe 1940 versus the horrible like flotsam and jetsam wandering around on the streets today, where you really don't know what you're looking at, right? I mean, a lot of people, it's like, I don't know what you are actually. The whole question of man and woman has become very obscure in your case. You know, like, it, and that's been a purposeful obscuring and it is a purposeful embracing of ugliness and saying, you're not allowed to say it's ugly, right? And they've made a little flag and everything. So we, <laughs> and you can see how near and dear they hold this just by how many people have this flag up. It's like, I myself might not be part of the trans agenda, but by golly, I support it. Um, you know, like we live on the corner up from us, three out of the four houses have a big, you know, trans flag hanging out. And none of them are trans. That's the thing. But this is a very, very important subject for them. And they are holding it really tightly that um, we are going to embrace ugliness and you're not allowed to say it's ugly because I love it and I find it beautiful and you can't judge me. And, and then Christians are like, oh, it's true. We're not supposed to judge, you know? And so <laughs> the whole thing is just a little bit of a mess. And I feel like our culture is so far down the road of ugliness and unhappiness that it is, I mean, it's, it feels self-evident at this point. But can an architectural style be God-hating, right? Can a musical style be actually a, an offense against heaven? And I think we, we get super simplistic about it. Like, like people want to say that an artistic style, it's only about counting the hells and dams in the dialogue, or it's only about how many square inches of skin we're showing. And that's like, that's as far as we go with our 
art criticism. And Oscar Wilde was, he knew what he was talking about when he was advocating this sort of, there's no such thing as morality in art. And actually he was such a brilliant author as well that he uh, could make this point very well and very effectively. And he did say one time, I thought he's Im immensely quotable, but I think he was in a um, gold mining town in Colorado in the saloon or something. And he said that the only sensible piece of art criticism he had ever seen was there. And there was a little sign on the piano that said, please do not shoot the pianist, he is doing his best. <laughs> But he did claim that there is no such thing as a moral component to art. And again, only Philistines would make a claim like that. There is no such thing as a moral component to art. So does God care what the music sounds like if the lyrics are clean, right? Does God care about things like architectural styles? Does God care about your hairdo, right? Is, is that something that our worldview speaks to or not. And so it's all great and fine to say, everyone, we need to be pursuing excellence and think of how persuasive this will be to the world if all the Christian women really embrace their calling and really enfleshed our theology and everything else. But if we don't actually believe that it works its way out into those details, then we're going to have a really hard time in fleshing it. So in terms of like mom's talk about, about pioneering, my point here is we have something that we have lost and we've lost it badly and it needs to be rebuilt. And we need to not just simply accept the multiple choice options that the world gives us. So like here are the different places you could go. We need to just be willing to think outside the box and really try and build something from scratch that has been lost. <clears throat> so again, what is beauty is a trickier question than what is a man or what is a woman. But I think that especially as women, we are called to think about that question and think about it like sensible grown-ups and not as like really simplistic, um, you know, I just, I thought superficially about this question and now I just do whatever I want. And I decorate my house, I choose my clothes, just however I want because, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, if you think about that phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, it really is, that is taking something and making it completely subjective, right? It's like there is no such thing as beauty, it's only what you find beautiful. It's making you the ultimate reference point for all aesthetic judgments. So the question is, does God speak to this? And I think that if we were to get really simplistic about it, we would say there's one godly jumper. That's what God likes. It's what all women need to wear. And that's really the mark of a cult, honestly, right? I mean, <coughs> excuse me. I feel like that's one of the things that, I feel like is one of the sort of ways you can know that the Bible was inspired by God is it says things that are like women should dress modestly. And you know if that was a, a human that wrote that, we would have had details about toga length. <laughs> and those details would have become obsolete as soon as it's a different culture, right? But it tells us be modest. And then every culture, every century, every continent has to work that out for ourselves, which just shows that it's not this little legalistic checklist. But as soon as, you know, we start trying to apply it in a wooden way and a simplistic way, it becomes this little checklist. Here's the jumper that's what you wear, or, or whatever. But I think it's clear that the Bible wants us to pursue this, but also, you know, God, God didn't put all the gold and the jewels in the world just lying out on top of the ground. He apparently wants us to dig, right? That's apparently something that he wants us as humans made in his image. He wants us to work for things, and he didn't just give it. He could have given us all of the, um, you know, like, here are all the medicines, here's the plants that you could... He wants us to work it out over time. He wants us to discover and experiment and pursue. And I think that that's just clear that he's built that into the way the world works. And so we have to be able to pursue these things like that and not in a wooden little checklisty kind of a way. So is beauty objective? I think right there we would lose a bunch of people, right? 
is beauty actually objective? A lot of, a lot of our sort of modern hackles go up at that, right? Because we sort of suspect that probably next they're coming for something that I like. Um, <laughs> and I'm not willing to give up, right? It's like there's this sort of suspicion that like, but there's all the things that I like over here and I am unwilling to ask the question because it might reveal that I have to change my opinion or change my style or change, change something and I'm comfortable as I am. So is beauty objective? And can there be a moral component to things like style? I think that we all, whatever we might say on the test when it comes to that, you know, with all the excuses and everything, we all know that it's totally true. Style, no matter what we're talking about, musical style, architectural style, you know, painting style, just your clothing style, it communicates. And I think clothing is a really easy one to make this point with. Clothing communicates, and we all know it, and that's the reason there are certain genes you would not be caught dead in, because you know what it would be saying about you, right? And we actually also know how to read other people's style. Like, this is a thing that we understand. So um, I remember doing a, like a little workshop at Logos um, where I wish that I had, could put it up on the screen because I could prove to you that we all know how to do this. You just put up two different, you don't need a head, just two outfits, two people. And you can ask the question, you know, like which one of these is probably more likely to practice yoga versus which one is more likely to own a chainsaw? You know, two men. We can tell by their outfit. We absolutely can tell. We can tell an actual cowboy from the uh, sort of hipster cowboy who's doing it ironically. And we can tell that simply by the genes, right? We know how to read it. We know which guy probably owns a chainsaw and which guy has probably got a violin concerto playing in his car. They're probably not wearing the same outfit, you know, because we express other things about us by means of our clothing. And that's why there are certain things that you're like, I would never wear pleated khakis or whatever it is, you know, because that would be saying that I was this thing over here and I am not this thing over here. You know, if somebody's got all the blinged out jeans, it's like, are they on their way to the rodeo or are they on their way to an opening of an art museum in Manhattan? It's like, you, we can tell, we understand this because we speak this language. We live in this culture and we speak this language and we all know how to do it. But for some reason, when it comes to the question on the test, do you speak this language? We're like, no, there is no language. You could never be sure, <laughs> but we do it. <clears throat> Excuse me, we do it all the time and we know how to do it. And so, I could show you two different outfits and say, which woman probably owns a minivan? Uh, we'd be able to tell, right? And there's other outfits you wouldn't wear because it would make you look like you owned a minivan. <laughs> <laughs> and you would hate to communicate that. Um, we understand that it communicates. And I actually really thought this was a kick when we moved to England years ago, I had no idea what anything meant. And it was really weird because you would walk into somebody's house and you don't understand it. It was like, here, you get it. You're like, ah, oh, yes, you're into thrifting or, oh, Pottery Barn. You're a big Pottery Barn person or whatever. Like we know how to read styles. We know that you're doing a shabby chic thing and we understand. And then I would go into somebody's house in England and I'm like, what is it? Like, I don't know, I don't know what it means. And the same thing with the outfits you would see on the street. It's just like, I, I suddenly, I don't speak this language anymore. This is really interesting. And it was, um, it just shows you that we all get used to it. We all have our little common tropes and things that we do. And we don't sometimes examine them very closely. We just kind of take them for granted and, and we go with it. But then as soon as it becomes a philosophical question, we deny the existence of any communication whatsoever. So if there was some, you know, girl who was obviously through her fashion and her hair and everything expressing, I'm doing really badly right now, like this is sort of a big cry for help. If you said that out loud, she looks like she's got some big problems. 
you would have a lot of defensiveness on the part of the Christians. You have no idea. How can you read her heart? You don't know. She might be the youth group leader. How could you possibly say she's not doing well spiritually? That's judgy and legalistic. And there's a very big defensiveness when it comes to like, do you see what she's doing with her hair? That seems like a spiritual problem. People get really defensive of it. But if we flip it around, it's actually quite interesting. I used to do this when we were having discussions in class at Logos. I'd be like, okay, everybody, you know, get out a piece of paper. I'm going to describe somebody to you. And you're going to describe her outfit and her hair, right? I'm going to tell you what she's like. And then you're going to describe it. And it's like you're going to introduce her in a story. What's she wearing? And what's, what does she look like? You know? And if I describe somebody who is got a really rough past with her dad and a whole string of boyfriends, lots of substance abuse, really into death metal, self-harming, you know, and she's, you know, whatever. Tell me what she looks like. Now, granted, there could be exceptions, but it never turned out to have an exception. I would make people go around and describe, okay, what does this girl look like? You know, torn fishnets and combat boots and, and spiderweb tattoo on her neck and black hair kind of in her face or whatever. Nobody gave me the, the chewing bubble gum wearing pink cheerleader. Now, it's possible, like people can be hypocrites, but we all know how to read these things, right? And when you say, okay, I'm going to tell you about this person, you tell me what they look like. If, if we're not, if our hackles aren't up, we all know how to do it. But as soon as you said, ah, the girl with the torn fishnets and the combat boots and the goth makeup and the hair in her face, I think she might be having a spiritual problem. A lot of Christians like, how dare you? How could you say that? That's just, it was a modest outfit. And that's as far as we can go. <laughs> um, so basically, I think we just need to realize that actually this is something we know how to do. Right? This, is, this is something that, that is built in and that we understand. I do think that when we you know, express our style in any department, your clothing, your house, your, you know, whatever it is, we are, we are kind of referencing something bigger. So I think Jemima described it, we were talking about this, as a link that you click through to get to the article, right? So when you are putting yourself together somehow or other, you're thinking of yourself as the link to all that. See, I admire all that stuff over there. And we want to express that that is, that's what I'm doing. You see, this is the music I like, or these are my people, kind of. And you're, the way you express it in your home or your clothes or whatever, it's a link to something else. And so when somebody looks at you and they sort of click through the link, what do they get to, right? Do they get to like emo despair or do they get to pot smoking trans culture? Do they get to kinky cosplay stuff? Do they get to hookup culture or sleazy soccer moms? You know, like what is it that if they take you, what you look like, what are you communicating? What group are you saying that you are from? Are you saying that you're part of this sort of earth-worshipping, meditative placidity of everything or, or like works righteousness through slubby linens and hormone-free chicken and minimalism and barefoot children? You know, there's, there's always something that there, there are those people, right? The people that I find to be very attractive and I have adopted their style you click through the link, right? It's like, see me, I'm a part of that group over there. Are you communicating that you like to play um, sort of retreatist dress up games, you know? Um, but what is Christian style? Like, what is that? Like, if somebody sees you and they click through, they hopefully shouldn't be thinking, oh man, I totally thought she was on Tinder and it turned out she was, she was just a nice church lady, you know? Um, hopefully what you, like the, the click through is something that you want to be leading people to. If beauty is persuasive, if it's powerful, if it draws people, then what are you pointing to when they look at you or they look at your home? What, what is that thing? And it should be the gospel, 
right? It should be the beauty of holiness. It should be Christ. It shouldn't turn out to be some like really weird pervy subgroup. And, and I think it's just too often we feel like, but I'm a Christian, my heart is pure, therefore what I do and how I express it is just up to me. I can just, I can just do whatever because God doesn't care about style or he doesn't care about aesthetics at all. When people sort of look at you and they think, like when I was in England, when, like, what is this? I don't know what this is. This is intriguing, but I don't have a category for it. I don't think we have a category for this right now. Like, this is something that, yeah, I mean, Christendom was a thing, but it's been, it's been bombed out now, aesthetically speaking. There was a time, yeah, when Christianity built beautiful structures and, and, you know, whatever, but that's long gone. And now we just have a lot of Christians kind of wandering around doing whatever and thinking that it, there's no moral component to it. Um, I do think it's important to note that all of these other little subgroups that I'm talking about, they actually know what they believe and they actually self-consciously are expressing it. It's weird that Christians often don't right? We just kind of adopt whatever style seems kind of cute. And they kind of know what they're doing though. And I feel like this is true of, of any real artist is that they know exactly why they're making the choices they're making. So if you have any innovator in the arts at all, right? Somebody who's blows everybody's minds and does something totally different and new and it's crazy. And you ask them to tell you about why, oh, they can right? Because the artists know what they're doing. They actually know what they're trying to express, and then they do it through aesthetics. Now, you then get all this sort of like, you know, the hacks and the copycats who come along, and they just know that it's popular and there's money to be made there. They don't know why they're doing it at all. They just kind of, you know, follow along in the wake. But any actual artist knows what they're doing, right? I think we could have back in the 90s, sat Kurt Cobain down and said, tell me about your musical style, he could have, right? He actually could have talked to you about the philosophy behind it because that's why he's doing it. And I feel like it's really interesting that homemaking and what we used to think of as the domestic arts, like think about that, we are supposed to be artists. We are supposed to be taking something and in fleshing it, embodying it, making it beautiful, and making those critical judgments that an artist knows how to make. But then that has become home economics, and then now it's just sort of a demeaning you know, thing. But it really is an artistic expression, and it should be thought of as an artistic expression the way a true artist would, would think. It's like, okay, what do I believe, and then how am I going to get that out? And how am I going to express something? So when when we're asking these kinds of questions, these are questions that the pagans know about, right? I think Christians have a weird vested interest sometimes in refusing to admit that those questions can be asked because again, it might open us up to having to change something. But the pagans know this, like that's why they're, that's why they're doing what they're doing. And all of these little subgroups, they're expressing their worldview and they're doing it through their clothing or through their architecture or whatever it may be. The problem is as soon as you start saying, okay, no, there's objectivity in this whole realm, um, we start to think that that means there's just one. There's just one little narrow stream and that's it. And that's all we've got. And it's going to be boring. And it's going to be terrible. But you just have to be willing to look, you know, past your own little narrow subgroup. Look at the creation that God gave us. How many kinds of beauty are out there in the world. You've got the ridiculous sort of jungle look. You've got the Arctic. You've got deserts. You've got, I mean, God is not saying like, oh, there's one little kind of beauty. Just look at his world. There is so much diversity and so many different ways that he is telling the story, that he is expressing beauty. It's all around us. And there is, it's not narrow. 
right? So I'm certainly not arguing there's one little thing called beauty and we all have to look like that. Like we all have to wear the godly jumper or whatever it may be. This is going to be so broad. Like we're, I'm looking at a room of women from all over this country. I would think it's going to be expressed in so many different ways. And so it is a really, really wide river, but that does not mean there's no such thing as upstream and downstream right? And I feel like our culture has gone all the way to the borders and, and is trying to get past it, right? Anywhere where there is something that we can kick down, we're going to kick it down. And we just need to accept the fact that like, no, God, God gave us beauty and he's talked about it in his word and he's shown it to us in creation. And we need to be able to look at those two expressions of his word, his written word and his spoken word, and we need to learn how to read it because we actually, this is something we do know how to do if we are willing to ask the questions. So I would say, honestly, just because it is objective doesn't mean it's narrow. And there's also, there's so many different tangents we could go on. This is such a huge subject. But I think if women started asking these questions and then treating it like a subject that needs study, and not just like, oh, that's cute. And then that's as far as you're going to go with it. Because our culture is at war with beauty. It's at war with the concept of beauty. And then in the places where we still sort of prize it a little bit, it's like feminine beauty has now been just gotten down to hot. She's hot. And when we say she's hot, what we mean is she's cheap and available and willing to sleep with whoever. Right? That's what we mean by hot. It's like we've reduced it down to the most cheap sexiness and that's what beauty is and I just think we need to like go back to the drawing board and be willing to like ask these questions and um when I I just looked through what does the bible say about beauty it was actually a very interesting thing to do because first I was like does the bible ever talk about ugliness like the word ugly is that in there and I couldn't really think of anything and so I looked it up in my bible app I just did a little search for the word ugly and the first thing that comes up is a whole list of possible Googles that I might be. And they're all like, I feel ugly. Why do I feel ugly? I'm so ugly. And it was like, this, this is too bad. And then, um, <laughs> and so I just didn't do those. I just said ugly. And what the Bible app gave me was a lot of verses meant to comfort me in affliction. It had nothing to do with ugliness. It was so weird. Like I look for ugly and it was like the Lord is my shepherd, you know, or perfect love casteth out fear. And it was like, it's actually just assuming that that's what I'm needing is comforting and whatnot. So then I got on my computer and looked it up and it apparently really only comes in in those cows that Pharaoh was dreaming about. <laughs> <laughs> and they were real ugly because it came up like seven times and then that was it. And, um, but beauty, there is a lot. There is a lot that, that the Bible has to say about beauty. And honestly, it's just really, I think, worth it for a lot of women to just kind of be willing to dig in and ask questions about it. So you actually um, notice it's overwhelmingly feminine when it talks about beauty, not exclusively, but overwhelmingly feminine, which makes sense. Women, jewelry, apparel, hair, flowers. Um, <clears throat> there are exceptions though for architecture. So it's like Jerusalem is described as, as beautiful. The stones of the temple are beautiful. There's the gate called beautiful. Um, Moses as a baby was beautiful. And the feet of those who bring good news are beautiful, but it's overwhelmingly feminine. But if you start looking at it, it's, there's so much to it and none of it is like cutesy and cozy. Like if you just start working through these, these um, verses, it's like a description of, of the woman as beautiful. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as an army with banners? Like it's awe-inspiring, it's majestic, it's royal, it's overwhelmingly, you know, like royalty, queens, you've got Song of Solomon, you've got Esther, um, you've got the jewelry, you've got the magnificent apparel. None of it is like hot. She's so hot. I mean, Dinah was beautiful, maybe. Maybe what's-his-name thought she was hot. Anyway, um, 
But I do think that it is interesting to note that it is, it is overwhelmingly sort of like awe-inspiring or majestic. But again, there's multiple kinds of beauty in the world. We can just see that from what God has created. But it's noticeable that outside of the feminine, it's Zion and God are described as beautiful, right? So Zion, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Jerusalem, thou art beautiful. Um, the the um, girl in Song of Solomon is described as comely as Jerusalem, right? But that's not, I mean, that's like magnificent again and awe-inspiring. It's not, it's not like she's so cute or she's so sexy or whatever. Um, God is described as beautiful, for they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land, for how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. But again, it's like, it's the ensign that's lifted up. It's like, this is, it's powerful and it's awe-inspiring. And, and I just think we need to be able to like work through those questions and then just look at the way God has made the world. And then when it comes time to express that aesthetically somehow, Ask yourself, am I swimming downstream with the way God has made the world? Am I cutting with the grain or am I in revolt against it and I'm going upstream? Because I do think, especially now, there are a lot of fashion statements that are all about disfiguring the image of God or obscuring the image of God or muddying up the image of God, not adorning the image of God. So it's like, are you... Are you taking the image of God and adorning, or are you smearing, muddying up, and saying, you can't say it's, you know, because this, I think it's beautiful, and so do other people in my subgroup, right? You have to ask, like, what does God think of it, though? And are you being obedient in how you're expressing these things? I do feel like, as women, we're trying to pick up this ruined culture, right? This completely obliterated, ruined culture. And I think, especially since we're in that pioneering again, like this sort of starting from scratch again, we have to think clearly and we have to think about these questions at a really baseline sort of philosophical level and then figure out how to be an artist, like figure out how to express this in some beautiful way that doesn't have to be cookie cutter. I just feel like there are so many options in the world. There are so many kinds of beauty. There are so many paths we could go on. Again, the river is really, really wide. This isn't going to limit us, but the world is limiting us, like absolutely limiting us. It's like, here are your four multiple choice options. And I think we need to have a little write in none of the above, (laughs) right? It's like, why should we take the sort of pre-perforated you know, the world wants us to be in one of these categories. We really need to be able to just say, actually, we're just gonna, we're just gonna start over. We're gonna start from scratch on this. So thank you very much. I see that everyone's fanning themselves quite hot. All right, thank you.